Uh, first, can we just give a hand to this awesome choir and the horns? We had horns this morning. Um, man, following that up, uh, my name is Tamarcus Ragland. I am the young adult minister here at Citizens Church, and it is my pleasure uh, to be here with you all. For those of you who are watching at home, uh, we're glad that you are tuned in. And hey, if you weren't here last week, um, my man Jamin did an awesome job of uh, introducing this new series that we're entering in uh, together. And I would encourage you to go back and listen to it, but just to give you a bird's eye view um, of where we're going over the next a uh, few weeks um, and months. Uh, there's two reasons of why we've chosen to make uh, wisdom our topic of discussion. Um, and the first, right, the, the general reason is that the Bible talks about wisdom, right? Like time and time again, we are shown how wisdom is woven into the very fabric of the created order, right? And it is peppered all throughout the landscape of Scripture, uh, calls to uh, learn wisdom and to seek wisdom and to walk uh, in wisdom. And so we want to just be faithful to what the Bible um, teaches us to do. And the second specific reason is that we live in a culture um, where truth uh, is, uh, absolute truth is not highly valued, right? That there's a, there's a lot of information um, that, that is ample and a lot of it is divisively charged and easily accessible um, and not very thought through. And so what's uh, equally ample in a, com in a community and culture like that uh, is confusion and misdirection. And so one of our hopes is that throughout this process, uh, we might learn uh, what it looks like to live um, wisely, or as we like to, to talk about it here, to live in God's world in God's way. And so our hope is that we will press into uh, what it looks like to be wise people together and the, the kind of the signpost that will uh, point us in that direction as we go through these things um, are threefold. It is wisdom's posture, wisdom's pace and wisdom personified. Um, and if you'll give me a few minutes this morning, I want to talk to us specifically about wisdom's posture. Uh, wisdom's posture, if we could sum it all up in one word, uh, is humility. Right, let's pray and bring the choir back out. We figured it out. Um, no, just kidding. But, but doesn't that feel pretty simple, right? Like you, you probably even guessed as soon as you heard me say we're talking about wisdom's posture, you're like, he's probably going to talk about humility and being humble, right? And you're right. And it's, it's not a hard concept for us to grasp. But the thing that we have to ask is if it's, if it's so simple, how come so many more people in our culture and in our time aren't marked by wisdom? Right? Like if it's such an easy concept to grasp, how come more and more of us aren't, um, aren't labeled and, and designated as wise? And I think, right, if we, if, we, if we really are honest, we know that humility, while it's not a while it's an easy concept, it's not um, an easy practice. And so if you have a Bible, I want you to uh, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 9. We'll be in it in just a moment, but uh, before we break into it, I just want to situate it um, within uh, the, the larger conversation of Proverbs. Um, it is broken primarily into two groups, right? Uh, the latter half uh, of Proverbs 10 to, to chapters 31 is where you find most of the sayings that you're familiar with when you think about the book of Proverbs, right? This is where Solomon takes the time to give us illustration after illustration of what it looks like to live in God's world, in God's way. Right? It's where we get to see the pictures of it. But in chapters 1 through 9, uh, he has a, a different goal in mind, and the, the, the language is a bit different. Right, if, if chapters 10 through 31 answer the question, how does someone live in God's world, in God's way, what, what Solomon does in chapters 1 through 9, like a good father um, teaching his son and us, the reader, he describes why should someone live in God's world, in God's way. And so all throughout this section, you'll find um, Proverbs like uh, what we find in chapter 2, verse 6 through 7. It says, for the Lord gives wisdom. And from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright, and he is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity in every good path. Right, like if those are things that appeal to us, he says, this is why you need wisdom. Or in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, you know this one. Uh, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. 
Or again in chapter 8, verse 10 through 11, he says, Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than gold, for wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare to her. This is why we need to be wise. And what we'll find is uh, what's happening here in chapter 9 in Proverbs is, is no different than what we see um, being called throughout of all of Scripture. Right, if we go back to the very beginning, it's no different than the call and the, the opportunity that was given to our first parents, Adam and Eve, when God uh, blessed them and gave them this beautiful garden for them to abide in and to become co-laborers with him so long as they didn't partake from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right, For the day that they took of it, they would surely die. Right? It's no different than the, the, the charge that Moses gave to the people of Israel right before he passed when he said, right, this day I give you life and I give you the choice of death, right? Blessings and, cur- uh, and curses, and he encourages them to choose the path that leads to life. It's no different than the, the charge that Joshua gives to the people of Israel when they're crossing into the promised land, when he says, choose ye this day whom you will serve, either Yahweh, the true and the living God, right, or the, the idols that the, that the pagans around us worship. It's not far off from what our Savior asks of us, right? When he says that that anyone who would call themselves my disciples must pick up their cross, die to themselves, and follow me. Proverbs uh, chapter 9 is situated within a chorus of voices within the Bible that tells us to choose the path that leads to life rather than the path that leads to death. So as you're reading through Proverbs, you get through the section, and you're at chapter 9, and by this point, you've listened to Solomon's words, and you say, okay, I get it, but where do I get started? Chapter 9 wants to offer that to us, right? What will separate us from the fool who goes down the path that leads to death, what will, what will make us go towards the path of wisdom is to adopt wisdom's posture. If you would look at me with chapter, look at me with chapter 9, we'll start at verse 1. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She also has set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn and hear. And to him who lacks sense, she says, come and eat my bread and drink of the wine that I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you, but reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me, your days will be multiplied and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. But if you scoff, You alone will bear it. But the woman folly is loud. She's seductive. She knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house and takes a seat at the highest place of the town, calling to those who pass by who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let them turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. One of my uh, favorite cartoons of all time is making a comeback uh, in the near future. It's uh, The Proud Family. If you don't know, yes, I see that. Um, Right? If you haven't heard of it, Disney Plus, do it. You'll be blessed. Um, And Chrissy and I, we, we still watch the old reruns over and over again. And there's one episode in particular where uh, Penny, the main character, and a group of her friends, they go and watch a movie, right? And it's called Jack Stone. He's a martial artist. And, you know, he's it's like any action movie, right? He's getting um, pummeled by all these different guys. And he's one man beating a thousand men with his bare hands. And it's great, right? It's action packed. And they walk out of the theater and they're so enamored by what they saw. They're like, man, I want to be like Jack Stone. I want to learn how to fight and how to defend myself and use nunchucks and all this stuff. Um, And it just so happened that one of her friends uh, actually had an uncle who had a dojo. And so they're like, we can get in this class and he could teach us. And so they're excited. They convince their parents to pay. They go. 
And the first day, all they do is paint the dojo, right? It's like very like Mr. Miyagi style. And afterwards, they're like, man, I did not pay to be Michelangelo, right? Like, I want to be Jack Stone. I want to learn how to fight. And so half of them leave the class, and they go find another class. Um, that's modeled after the movie Jack Stone. And so they get to go and they're taking pictures with Jack Stone. They get to uh, reenact scenes from the movie and they're jumping on trampolines and getting action shots of them posing like they're real martial artists. And they're having so much fun. In fact, after each day, they get another black belt, right? So every day they leave and they come back and they're a third degree black belt and a fourth degree black belt. And uh, lo and behold, at the, end of the, at the end of the episode, there's a competition. Right? And as you could probably imagine, the team over here who stuck the, with the Mr. Miyagi way, painting, you know, wax on, wax off, uh, when it came down to actually performing what they had been learning, they beat the other team in every category. Right? Their form was better. They had more endurance. They had more balance. They beat them in the spars. And one of the, one of the young ladies who was at the, the fun Jack Stone class said, I don't understand. How are they beating us? We're dressed better than they are. I've got like 10 black belts. And I, we took all these pictures and we were with Jack Stone. And she was right, right? Like they had so much more, th right? They had more belts, they had more pictures, they got to spend more time with Jack Stone. But the reality was they never submitted themselves to the process. And so while they had more things, they themselves were less. They had incurred um, a lot of fun and they got to have a lot of fun, but they themselves did not actually learn how to do martial arts. And in our text today, we too face two options, right? We got to see this beautiful display of wisdom, and we say we want that. And when we leave the theater, there are two homes that await us, right? Lady, lady wisdom is, is, is calling out to us, right? We see wisdom personified as a woman, and she has prepared this, this wonderful house, right? She has uh, created a home with seven pillars, right? This picture of um, completion in the scriptures, and there's food that she's prepared and she set the table and she's inviting us in and everyone who comes into her home will be nourished and they'll find security and they'll find flourishing and protection. But for everyone who comes in, there is something that is required of them. Here's the problem with that. There's another home that's not far from there. And in that home, we see a foolishness personified as Lady Folly. And she too has a home to invite us in and she too has a meal prepared. And the, the difference between her house and the Lady Wisdom is that when we come into that house, uh, we don't have to, right, we don't have to abide by anything. And so we would like to see this, this picture of Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly as this, right, this, this beautiful path and this really dark and scary path. But the reality is the Bible says Lady Folly is seductive, right? She's good at what she does. It looks like it's pretty good, but in the end it leads to us having black belts without having skills. So how do we make the right decision, right? How do we know which house we are in and which home we're headed towards, right? Because none of us wants to be fools, right? I don't want to be a fool who has a bunch of black belts that still get me beat up at the end of the process, right? And Proverbs 9 tells us there's, there's one thing that we have to avoid, and there's two things that we have to adopt if we want to take on wisdom's posture. So what is, first, what is the thing that we have to turn from and let go of? And it's it's quite simple, right? She tells us that we have to let go of pride, right? And, and what does that mean exactly, right? There's, there's multiple kinds of ways pride gets displayed, um, and two of which are, are more obvious than one, right? Like we know the obvious kind of pride where somebody has um, really boastful about the things that they have accomplished or, or who they are, right? It's that picture of Nebuchadnezzar standing over his kingdom and looking out and saying, look at what I've accomplished. I'm the man. I did this. I built this. Right. And, and God ultimately had to humble him. Right. But we we understand that kind of, of of pride and maybe we we struggle with that. But that's easy for someone in our life to, to point out. There's another kind of pride that's easy to point out. We all know that person. Right. Who thinks they're further along or higher um, than they really are. But it's really evident to everyone around them. They're not. Right. It's like that guy like 24 hour fitness or lifetime fitness that comes in with the headbands and like the three layers of socks evenly divided so you can see all the Nike checks and his gym bag and he's ready, right? And he can't make a layup, can't rebound, can't play defense or play basketball at that matter, right? And it's like, if that's you, just one pair of socks is enough. Buy a smaller shoe, don't be that guy, 
right? But like those, those kinds of, that kind of pride is very obvious for us to see, right? And I think there's a, another kind of pride that is more subtle and probably trips us, us, trips us up more um, because we don't recognize it as pride as often. Um, when I was in college, uh, I went to Bible college in Spokane, Washington, and I had a philosophy professor who has grown to be a really dear friend of mine. Um, but at this time, it was my senior year. I had put philosophy off to the end because I was just, you know, I was afraid of it. And um, I, was, uh, I was really wanting to grow in my education, right? School had never been something that came easily for me. And, and then when I got to Bible college, I was really trying to grow and I was struggling. And so here I am in his office hours and I'm, I'm crying and I'm trying to tell him all the things of why I can't succeed. And I'm like, everyone reads faster than me and they can write better than me. And I just feel like I can't get it. And I've tried this and it's not working. And I sit in your class and you know, you're, you've read all these books and you know all these theologians and philosophers and I've never heard of them before and I just feel like I should be better and I should know more and I'm, and I'm thinking that I'm really like, you know, pushing forward and I'm crying and, you know, he's patient with me, he listens and I get to the end of my spiel and he's like, can I, can I be honest with you? And I'm like, yeah, just, you know, tell me what can I do? Uh, he says, um, I think your problem is uh, pride. And I was like, oh, no, I'm, I'm real humble. I just want to figure out how to pass your class. Um, he said, no, I think it's pride. And, and he was right. And what he helped me to see was, um, of course, he was more well-read than me. Like, of course, he, he understood the subject matter better than I. He was the professor, and I was a student, and I was there to learn. And like, yes, my writing needed improvement. And yes, there was improvements that I could make in my reading. And here's the thing, like, it was perfectly fine because I was at school to learn. And the reality was I was so distraught because I wasn't trying to learn. I wanted to impress the people around me, right? I wanted to be the guy in the class that could give the answer. I wanted the professors to look at me and like, that, that guy has it. And here's the, the reality, right? Like I wanted to have more without having to become more. And I couldn't become more because I wouldn't submit myself to the process, right? I wanted to, to be more than I was without having to become more. And I couldn't become more because I wouldn't submit myself to the process. I'm curious what this could look like um, in the rest of our lives, right? Where God is trying to teach us something and he's trying to take us somewhere, but we're so busy complaining about where we're not and where we think we ought to be and what we think we ought to be doing instead of where he has us that we miss the lesson that he's trying to teach us. Right, like God is trying to teach us something in our uh, season of singleness, or he's trying to teach us something where we are in our marriage, or he's trying to teach us something in our career path, or in our edu educational journey, or wherever we are in life, and we're too busy saying, no, I should be right here, and no, I should be able to do this by now. And, and it doesn't sound this way um, maybe to us out, out loud, but in the recesses of our heart, what we may be saying to God is, God, you don't know what you're doing with my life. Right? And that's a very different statement than, God, I don't, I don't know what you're doing with my life. Right? There's, there's space for questions and for unknown. But the, the former goes further. Right? Like behind that statement is this thought that, God, if you were really good, if you were really just, if you were really generous, if you really knew what you were doing, you'd be doing it my way rather than this way. And while this might not be the kind of pride that stands up on the mountain and boasts like Nebuchadnezzar, it's not the kind of pride that struts down the street. In the recesses of our heart, it is pride all the same, and it stops us from being able to grow in wisdom. So what's the, what's the danger of harboring that kind of pride? Look at what Folly says in verse 16 through 18. Folly calls us. She says, whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. See, the danger of this kind of pride is when you think that your way is better than God's way and you think that you can develop a plan that will provide more first, uh, flourishing and that will give you more security and more joy and more happiness, then what happens is when you hear folly calling and she gives you this sweet deal, we'll be eager to take it. Right, like when you have a, a hunger for something else and a discontentment with God and where he has you, right, that is the perfect recipe for a dinner to end at Folly's house. Right, and this is why, right, because her invitation is easy. Right, she doesn't require anything of you. She's not asking you to leave your pride at the door. In fact, she invites it in. She sits down at the table with you. And she's the, the perfect yes man, right? 
You have been given more than you've been getting. You deserve to just focus on you right now. You should have gotten that promotion. Look, you, you should do whatever it takes to get it. Even if you got to cut some corners, like the ends justify the means. Or like, you know what, you, you don't need to tell anybody about that. Like, think about what you could lose if you were to expose that. Like, just keep that hidden. We, we can work this out. Besides, it's not a big deal. You've got it all under control. You see, Folly doesn't rebu uh, rebuke our pride. She justifies it. And a dinner, a dinner at Folly's house means that you're always right and you're never wrong. You're always right and you're never wrong. And that's just another way for her to say, do what's right in your own eyes. And as Jamin said last week, that is the perfect way to end up a fool. Right? None of us, none of us want this. Right? We are seeking wisdom. And so what is the way that we, we leave that? Right? Um, wisdom would have us leave this kind of pride behind. And so what are the two things that we can uh, adopt? Or what are the two things that we can cultivate in our lives that would allow us to take on wisdom's posture so that we can actually move forward in wisdom. It's two. The two things we have to do. First, we have to welcome discipline. And the second is we have to love the path. We have to welcome discipline and we have to love the path. Look at verse 7 through 9. Lady Wisdom says, Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man and cures injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you, but reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will grow uh, still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. One of the wisest men that I know is a mentor of mine. He's been my mentor since I was in the fourth grade. His name is uh, Stan Shepard, or we call him 1-800-STAN. Uh, because if your, if your parents ever uh, had to call him because you had some um, uh, issues going on at school or whatnot, he had this like spiritual gift of discipline. Like, he was just this 6'5", you know, strong, lean, quick guy, right? Kind of frightening, but I love him to death, right? And he was, he was very wise, and I'm, I'm grateful for his presence in my life. Um, but I remember one day specifically, we had, he had taken me and a group of my friends to Waffle House after church one day. And we're sitting down, and the, the, the waitress comes to the table, and she's getting ready to take our orders. And she's like, oh, hi, welcome to Waffle House. How can I? And I'll never forget this, right? He has the, the menu in front. He's got a real deep voice. And he says, give me eggs, give me sausage, give me a waffle. Puts the menu down. And me and my friends are like, um, Mr. Stan, 1-800-SIR, uh, in all due respect. Like, what was that? Like, who orders food like that? That was so rude. And, we're, and he was like, what? And he was like, what do you mean? We were like, that was rude. You didn't even make eye contact. It was like Thor. Like, I don't know what was happening. Um, and so we, we, like, joked about it while we were eating. But I'll never forget this. Before we left, uh, he called the waitress back to the table. And he apologized to her um, in front of us. And then when she walked off, he, he told all of us, he was like, you know, thank you for calling me out on that. Like, that wasn't. I didn't, that was just a blind spot, and I didn't see it, and thank you for calling me on it. And here's what he could have did, right? What he could have did was posture up and say, like, who are you guys to tell me? Like, I'm the mentor, you're the mentee, and, right? And he could have, he could have resisted, but this is the, the thing about the wise, right? The wise welcome correction and discipline, right? Those who have adopted wisdom's posture are comfortable admitting their flaws and, and their sins because they're not trying to protect this false sense of honor or this false sense of of protection, right? They only seek to grow in their wisdom and in holiness. And so rather than posturing up, he took on wisdom's posture and got low and he apologized and he made it right. Right? Uh, the wise have nothing to prove. They know that they still have room to grow and things to learn and that that's okay, that that is a part of the process of growing in wisdom. And so they anticipate and invite discipline. Psalms 141.5 says it like this, let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It is like oil upon the head. Do not let my head refuse it. They long for discipline because they know without it, they won't be able to grow in holiness and ultimately be able to progress down the path of wisdom. Right, like, think about it. This is the, the difference between Saul and David, right? Remember, uh, both of them uh, were, were found guilty of sin. It wasn't like Saul sinned and David was perfect, but it was how they responded when they were found in Folly's house, right? Like, Saul gets confronted by Samuel, and he's like, oh, you know, I, the, the troops told me, and I, I, I kind of did what God told me to do, but no, like, I was, I was trying to be obedient, and it wasn't until God revoked his kingship and took everything away that he finally apologized for what he had done. 
But David wasn't like that, right? David, uh, when he's found in Folly's house as an adulterer and a murderer, and he's approached by the, the prophet Nathan and shown his sin, he immediately runs out of Folly's house towards wisdom, right? He says it in Psalms 51 like this. He says, Lord, before you and you alone have I sinned. He wasn't thinking about, oh, how, what am I, I going to lose? Is the, is the kingdom going to be gone? Like, what are they going to say about me on the new, right? He wasn't thinking about that. All he was thinking about was, I have, I have broken the heart of God, Lord. Would you, would you keep me? You could take everything away as long as I don't lose you. Why? Because pride always wants to protect honor, but humility only wishes to grow in holiness and wisdom. So the first thing we have to do is we have to learn, right, to, to welcome and to accept discipline. The second thing we have to do is we have to love the path, right? If we want to cultivate wisdom's posture, we have to love the path. What does that mean? Um, another mentor of mine, uh, Pastor Charles, I called him PC, uh, him and his wife actually uh, introduced me and my wife uh, to one another when we were in high school, and they've been an uh, uh, integral part of our lives um, all along. And I'll never forget, I'm in college. I needed a lot of wisdom in college. I was a fool. Um, I'm in college, and we, at this point, we're sophomores. We know we want to get married one day, and I want it that day to be today, right? Like, I was like, I'm, I'm ready now. And I remember having these conversations with him, like, you know, we were long distance. She was still here. And I was like, maybe I could just you know, go back and, and study online, or maybe she can come here and transfer schools, and we can work it out and figure it out and finish school. And every single time he would say, no, like, keep doing what you're doing, enjoy the journey. Keep doing what you're doing, enjoy the journey, right? He would say that over and over again. And one day, just like Lady Wisdom said, right, because I was at, operating out of foolishness, I became hostile to the wisdom that he was giving us. And so I was like, what, do you just not think I'm going to be a good enough husband? Like, do you not think I'm good enough for her? Like, I don't understand. And, you know, newsflash, guys, like, we're never good enough. Like, you women, our wives are a blessing. And the sooner we learn that, like, the better we are in the process, right? That's another sermon for another day. But he was right. And so he, I'm talking, I'm like, what is it? Like, I just thought he, he didn't think I would, I, would, I would measure up. And he said, you know what? Um, he's like, it's not that I don't think you'll make a good husband. I think you'd be a great husband. But here's the thing, right? Your relationship is like a boat. Right? Wise people always say stuff like that, right? right. He's like, your, your relationship is like a boat. He's like, if y'all set sail right now, he's like, I have no doubt that you'd get to the other side. He's like, you'd get to the other side. He said, what I'm concerned with is that if you left right now, like, you'd probably hit some storms that you could have otherwise avoided. He said, you might take on some cannon fire that you otherwise could have avoided. He said, I'm not just concerned with the boat getting from one side to the other side. I'm concerned about the condition of the boat along the journey. And I was like, God, oh, he's right. I got to wait, right? And here's the thing, right? Like, I praise God for his words um, and his presence in my life because he probably saved us from a lot of unseen danger. But this is what he was saying, right? He was like, I'm not just concerned with you getting the black belt, right? I'm concerned that you actually get the skills along the way so that it means something when you get it, right? Like, he wasn't just concerned about me getting the prize at the end. He was thinking about my form. He was thinking about my character. He was thinking about my development. He wanted me to fall in love with the process. That's why he would say it over and over again. Enjoy the process, and there's something about the path towards wisdom. There's something about the process to wisdom that the wise learn to, to, to enjoy, that it excites them. Right? I thought he was just being hard on me because he didn't think I was a good husband, but the reality was he wanted me to be a wise husband. He was raising the bar. And the wise, what they do is they, don't, they learn not to see the path of humility as a burden, but as a, a beautiful thing and an opportunity for us to, to take on. How can, we, how can we find that kind of path beautiful? Like, what do, we, what do we do to bring on that path? Well, first, we have to realize that, that we were made for the path. There's a little book on humility by a man named Andrew Murray. He was a South African pastor uh, around the, the late 19th century. And listen to what he says about humility, how he describes it. He says, The Christian life has suffered where believers have not been guided to see that even in our relationships as creatures— Nothing is more natural and more beautiful and more blessed than to be nothing in order that God may be everything. It needs to be made clear that it is not sin that humbles, but grace. 
It is the soul occupied with God in his wonderful glory as creator and redeemer that will truly take the lowest place before him. And maybe this is what the wise see that the fool doesn't, right? That they're able to take on the posture of humility, not just because they're sinners and, and they've done wrong and they need to shrink um, from an angry God, but that they realize that even if we were in the seat of our first parents, if we were in the garden without sin and without um, decay, and we were uh, uh, perfectly um, obedient to the Father, that we would still be right to humble ourselves before God because he's God and we're not. They don't see it as a burden. They see it as something beautiful. And Lady Wisdom invites us, right, leave an experience behind that you may live and pursue the way of understanding. This sounds a lot like Jesus' invitation that I mentioned earlier, right? If anyone would be my disciple, he must pick up his cross, die to himself daily, and follow after me. Humbling yourself before God is not, not something that you did in just a moment when you started to uh, believe in him, but it is a, a way of life, right? It is a path that we get invited to walk alongside our Savior with day after day. And the foolish, right, they can't, they can't take that, right? They're not patient enough for the path because they just want the black belt without having to learn the process. But what the wise know, what they learn is that humility is the doorway, Right? We only fall in love with the path when we start to learn that we have to love God's glory more than our own. Right? We have to love God's glory more than my own. A good friend of mine, Pastor Aaron Moore, would describe it this way. He says, humility is aggression for God, but pride is aggression for self. Right? Humility isn't this, this weak, passive thing that we just kind of loathe our way in, but it is a resolute decision to pursue righteousness and to leave behind foolishness, no matter what it costs us. No matter the cost, I, um, I used to uh, serve at a ministry called Youth for Christ, and there was a young man um, who was a, a part of it. Um, I never actually got to meet him uh, or know him, but I'll never forget his story. Um, and where we were in Spokane, like a few, few months prior, there had been um, this, this crime that was committed. A woman in the park had been mugged, and somebody had uh, basically hit her with a bat and took her purse, and lo and behold, she ended up losing her life. And, there was nothing caught on film. Nobody saw it. There were no witnesses. Um, and nobody knew what was going on. Right? And this young man, he had started to come to the Youth for Christ meetings and eventually got tied in with some mentors. And they were meeting weekly, uh, you know, week after week and went off to the, the Youth for Christ camp. And his life was changed by the gospel, right? He, he received Christ, uh, the, the Holy Spirit indwelt him. Um, he started to see his foolishness and turned from it and wanted to walk down a path of wisdom and was just excited to, to start this new journey um, with God. And so he uh, has this big change happen at camp and they come back um, afterwards and he uh, tells his mentor, he says, there's something that I got to do. And he takes himself to the police station. He says, you know, at this time, it was uh, a few years later, and he said a few years ago, uh, there was a, a crime committed in the park. Um, a, 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 you know, a woman was mugged and uh, ended up losing her life, and he said, I'm, I'm the one who did it. Here's the thing, right? Like, the world would see that, and they would go, man, that's foolish. I like, no one knew. You could have you gotten away with it. You could have gone and, and lived a life. God would have forgiven you. Like, nobody saw it. And, and, right, the world caused that foolishness. But God looked down and he said, man, that was wise. Why would somebody do something like that? Because he valued God's glory more than his own. He knew, like David, that even though there was no footage, even though there were no witnesses and nobody saw what was going on, God saw what happened. And he wasn't worried about what the world thought about his decision. He wasn't worried about what that would mean, what would be taken away. But he said, God, before you and you alone have I sinned. I'm willing to lose everything if I don't lose you. Family, what I would like to ask is, what is it that, that God, that wisdom might be calling you to leave behind? Or maybe something that he's calling you to that the world might look at and say, man, that's foolish. That would cost too much. Why would you do that? You don't have to do, no one knows, right? What is it that God is calling you to turn from or to go towards that the world might call foolish, but to God is wise? What I want to encourage you to do is, right, you might look down the road and even now God is impressing something upon you and you're like, I know, I know what you're calling me to, but I'm looking ahead and the road seems far and it seems difficult and I'm not sure how I'm going to make it and, and what about this and what about that? And you don't know what's coming in the front and that's okay. 
You don't have to know what's coming down the path, but what you do know is what he's asking you to do today. Right? You know how he's asking you to be obedient today. And just like we end every service, in a few minutes we're going to sing our song of benediction. And maybe um, what, we're, what we're asking uh, of you today is that you would just believe those words, right? That we would do the next obedient thing and that we would believe, right, that the, the one who we walk alongside, the one who's leading us towards wisdom can keep you from falling. That he'd be able to, to sustain you to the end. Would you welcome the discipline? Would you learn to love the path? Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, I'm so grateful that you have grace for the fool. Lord God, I'm so grateful that, that, there's, that, there's great, that you are patient with us along the path. That we have a guide who can walk alongside us enduring our foolishness. Oh God, that you don't shrink away from us, but you pursue us. You seek us. You're running after us, Lord God. And you're just asking us, I, I know it's scary. I know you don't understand, but would you just trust me and know that, that what I have for you is better than what's waiting for you in Folly's house? Oh God, would we be a people who would who would welcome that discipline, Lord God. We be um, uh, moldable so that you might be able to make of us so that we may be able to become what you've called us to be. And Father, we learn to love the path that we would know that we are not just humbled before you because we're in sin, but we're humbled before you because we are your creatures and you've created us for yourself, Lord God. Father, I'm thankful for what you are doing in each and every one of us, Lord God. I pray that you would give us strength for the path um, give us perseverance for the journey that we might grow in wisdom and adopt wisdom's posture. It's in your son Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen.